for logging that the person go behind YouTube. Right? Um, Steve, we are very, very happy to have you here in Singapore. Uh, this is a place that you visit a couple of times, but uh, not really in a public sense. Right? And uh, we are very happy to have you here to attend uh, this uh, tech venture and share with us yesterday about some of your journey in uh, uh, starting a YouTube as well as uh, doing some of the wonderful things in uh, Silicon Valley as well as some of your childhood, a little bit of childhood. So uh, today, okay, what we're going to work on is that uh, to, to listen to him. And uh, there are two particular areas that we are very, very interested in, especially from a Google system set point, is that number one, okay, how does the story of YouTube come about and what are the challenges that you face as someone? And of course, that, uh, a lot of you before that they asked the question is that how did you manage to get YouTube to exit to Google? Uh, imagine that nowadays it's quite common to exit a multiple uh, billion dollar exit to a big MSC, but during that time, about eight years ago, okay, it's not easy. How does the talk come about? Okay, what is the thought process behind it? But without further ado, okay, let me just start with uh, some of the earlier portion of it is that to, to get him started okay, by asking a few questions. Sure. Okay. Uh, so, see, uh, what we are very interested to know is that uh, YouTube come about through what you call a garage where you all spend some time. Kind of like a luxurious garage, okay, well equipped. And uh, how does the innovation process came about in such environment? Sure, sure. No, that's a good question. Um, uh, it helps to answer that probably by just giving a, a brief summary of sort of how I ended up in Silicon Valley in the first place, right? I, uh, I wasn't, for people who don't know, I wasn't born in the U.S. I was born in Taiwan. Um, I spent the first eight years of my life in Taiwan before moving not to the Bay Area, but to Chicago. Uh, to, to, uh, I moved to the Chicago area, so it's kind of in the Midwest where I spent my uh, elementary school, junior high, high school, college. I went to University of Champaign-Urbana, the computer science program, which kind of developed along with the, the United States government, the NTSA, uh, the, the first browser, the internet, and many of the guys that ended up starting companies like PayPal and Yelp and Slide and even YouTube came from sort of U of I as well. Um, I think the, the other thing about sort of that period of my life was I went to this experimental public boarding school. Um, so there was a, about the age of 13, 14 when I entered. And so this was a, this was a state funded school by the state of Illinois. And it was, uh, you kind of take this kind of test to, to get in. But uh, it was sort of highly focused and concentrated on math and science. And this is still 93, 94. So at the time, you know, there were no browsers. Uh, for people that were, that were in the room that were using the internet during that period, it was still sort of Linux was just coming into into its first 1.0 version. People were still, there was no security around, and a lot of the sort of protocols and a lot of the technologies that we see today, they were just being talked about during that phase. And so it was a pretty exciting time, I think, to be growing up in a period where you actually saw going from grade school to sort of high school, there was no such thing as the internet, and actually going through that phase where it was, the technology was slowly being developed and then of course, just very quickly, five years, ten years past that, and it's completely pervasive across all the internet. Um, you know, I have two young kids, two-year-old and a four-year-old, and uh, they're, 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 it's funny because they pick up magazines nowadays, and they're actually trying to swipe <laughs> magazines because they think everything is an iPad to touch it or things, you know? Um, and so I think that, that's the, the amount of change, whereas five years ago, six years ago, that tablets that wasn't even around. Um, but so uh, I, I went to, I immigrated to the U.S. in 1986 when I was eight years old. Um, and I spent the sort of 13 years there before I went to the Bay Area, to Palo Alto, where PayPal was, uh, PayPal was the, the reason that I moved to the Bay Area to Silicon Valley. Um, and PayPal, again, was a kind of co-founded, I think, by uh, Peter Thiel and Max Levchin. Uh, Max Levchin was the CTO of the company. Peter Thiel was the CEO of the company. CTO Max was also a U of I computer science major. And the two of first engineers that he hired were, again, both computer science majors from U of I, but also uh, sort of graduates of the same high school. So many of the, uh, and, and actually beyond that, many of the first engineers 
uh, from PayPal all came from Illinois because uh, just Max himself, he came, most of his friends, most of his contacts, they were all made during the Illinois times. He, he moved out just one year prior to PayPal starting. He didn't have a lot of contacts. Whereas, and then you know, there's the other side, the business side of PayPal mostly came from Stanford, which of course we feel went to school. Uh, and then, you know, that, uh, that was about six, uh, that was about uh, uh, six years there from 1999 to 2005. And we can kind of deep dive into everything that's happened there. But, you know, there was everything from the, the couple months after going into PayPal, the, the whole dot-com crash happened there. So sort of nine out of 10 companies all failed during that phase. Um, PayPal was one of the very few companies that succeeded out of that. And I think that because of that, uh, just to be able to actually survive that period, not even succeed, but just to survive that period. I think if a lot of the people within PayPal learned a lot about just survival, about being uh, more fit, being, uh, being able to be more resourceful, being able to be doing more with little or with smaller resources, smaller teams. Um, there was the IPO itself and then the eventual acquisition by, by eBay. Um, the, the first day that I moved, and I remember this clearly, it was November 22nd, 1999, was when I got off the plane to get into Palo Alto and, and start at PayPal. Um, the first day I actually met Chad Hurley, who was eventually, I, well, at the time he was the first designer um, that PayPal hired. He designed the PayPal logo, as you see it today. Um, and he was eventually the co-founder of YouTube six years later, right? Um, I think he considers himself, I don't know, many people know this or not, he considers himself to be the only CEO that's designed the logo of his company, because he was the one that designed the YouTube logo. Um, and uh, and I, I mean, there are a few days that, that, are, that are very, very prominent in my mind. I remember uh, when we first came up with the YouTube logo, the YouTube name itself, it was just, uh, it was in a garage um, in Menlo Park. But it was a nice garage. I mean, it, uh, there was heating. There was uh, there was plenty of drinks. There was. I mean, it wasn't the the, the typical what you think of, of a garage environment. But um, it was February 14th, so it was Valentine's Day, 2005. And we're sitting around the garage, coming up and, and thinking about this idea. Uh, and I wasn't. Ex he came up with both the name and also the logo. Uh, the name, when you actually, I don't know. When I first thought of the name itself, it didn't really it didn't really strike me as something that was going to really resonate. Um, and he, he, within about 15 minutes coming up with the name, he started actually doodling around on the board. And he still has, or we still have this sort of whiteboard image. We never erased it since that first day that we actually came up with the logo. He came up with the logo on YouTube. And I think once I saw that logo, I was so dumb. And there was no more discussions. We went out, registered the domain name. You can look it up today. I know who is record. You can see that it was registered on you know, February 14, 2005. Um, yeah. I love it for a second. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, it, I think there was a good thing. I mean, when we're talking about uh, the startups and, and how you find the co-founders, right? I think that uh, there's a couple things. One, I think it's really important to have a co-founder because there's going to be just so many different whatever decisions, the talking point, product ideas. I mean, they always it's 50 50 they both look and sound perfectly acceptable routes to go. And uh, to be able to have someone that you can sort of intrinsically trust, right? Um, that you can open up and just say, these are the real sort of negatives and positives that I have about this idea. To have that person be there day in, day out, anytime uh, available to you, and to be fully committed into it, uh, the only person you're ever going to be able to find that is, is, is in another co-founder. So I think that was very important. Uh, it's difficult to find the right co-founder. I happen to work with chat on just from like the shopping cart that PayPal has to, there's just a number of products that we had already worked on together. So while we were co-founders of YouTube, we had already worked together for six years. Uh, and we kind of sort of tested um, our working abilities together on, on, on different features. So it was a good working start, but we already knew how each other worked. Uh, yeah. So, so with that, um, how do you think about, I mean, start innovating play with multiple different ideas before you eventually come up with a service that uh, allowing people to upload videos, okay? I mean, the YouTube has become a fixture in our life right now. I mean, my nine years old, whenever he want to ask a question, okay, he don't go Google, he go YouTube. 
because you will find lessons in all these things down there. And of course, there's sometimes like being a parent, so you are trying to stop them from watching it. And they were all high under the bed, okay, at night and start watching it. You know, there's, there's so much influence of YouTube having on them. But how do you come up with that ideas, you know? Yeah. Is that the evolution, or is it something that just fucked it? Well, there's a... Uh there are two answers to that. One of them is the true answer, and the other one is what we gave to all the press for the first 12 months when we were asked the question how their music started. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, when we originally got funding from Sequoia Capital, uh, we met with a PR agency, and I do remember it was a six hour, it was the first meeting ever with a PR agency, it was a six hour session, and the entire six hours, they were spent on this one question about when you get an interview question about how did YouTube start, we need to come up with an answer. And the, the, the answer about us sitting around in a garage and actually tinkering around and figuring out wasn't, just wasn't sexy enough for what they wanted. So and we came up with the whole story about, uh, and it came back to haunt us, uh, but we, we came up with this whole concocted story about it was sort of, you know, having a dinner party in my place. And I can tell the fic fictional story better than I can tell the actual but you know, it was, it was talking about uh, the, but the just, just general idea. I mean, the, the, the fictional version is that we were having this dinner party, and we were having everybody had these phones and cameras around, and it was very easy to take photos. But um, and then just not to take photos, but to also share photos. There are many services even in 2005 to be able to upload and share photos at the time. While at the same time, uh, all these digital devices they could take videos, and they had the video modes, but it was very difficult to take and uh, to upload and to share these videos for a lot of reasons, you know, um, things like uh, the different kind of codecs out there, uh, needing to be able to download uh, software rather than being able to have an embedded video player inside the browser, um, just the, the upload speeds, uh, the videos are just 20, 30, 40 times larger than an image, so you're talking about having to wait 20 minutes. If this is with broadband, uh, even and it's just unthinkable if you were still on modem days to be uploading these videos. Um, but that's the fictional version. The real version of the story was no, we were just sitting around and talking. I mean, it, it's they, I think they're similar in that we were talking around in Chad's garage, talking about what was going to be the next big thing, right? And um, I think that YouTube, looking back, I never thought that. We had any doubt the idea was going to work. I think it was rather or not the technology was ready for it, right? Um, so, I mean, I think it's, it's, it could have been obvious to anyone that video was going to work, uh, that you already started being able to use the internet to share, distribute emails, text, instant messages, images, news, you know, and then it's going to be the next thing was going to be videos. It was just whether or not the, you had, people had enough uh, broadband penetration to be able to upload a video, whether or not broadband was cheap enough where, because you're streaming the videos every time, whether or not you can actually stream, when you're paying for the streaming for every one of the videos, was it going to be cheap enough? The codec that we ended up eventually using was a flash codec that just came out less than six months after, or six why, months before. Why did you jump on flash at the time? Because it's something that's not so proven. I would say even now, there is no, oh, so I think there are a few, other technologies we played with. Um, you had Windows Media Player, QuickTime, and Real Player. Those were the, really the three. And all of them just didn't work across all platforms. And so it was, something would be telling you, please go download the Windows Media Player. Um, it wouldn't work on the Mac. Um, even if it did work, you know, there would be audio codec, there would be a lot of problems with So a lot of it was sent to Apple, a lot of it was just Windows, a lot of it required downloading other pieces of stuff into the browser. Uh, flash at the time was, was about 90% plus penetration within browsers. That just meant 90% of the browsers could automatically start playing this stuff. Uh, and so it was, but then it wasn't just that, I mean, it was choosing the codec, but then it was then, there was over 240 different audio codecs and about 120 different video codecs, and however combinations of actually putting these together, YouTube at the beginning was doing this real-time transcoding. So everything that was uploaded from, it had to understand all these different combinations of codecs and then transcode them real-time uh, on the fly and then output the transcoded version so anybody and everybody can watch it with their player. Um, but I would say even you know now, it's almost a decade since YouTube started, there still isn't, I think this is still a problem, is that there's still a lack of standard on, standardization on sort of the, the, the video and audio codecs to be used out there. 
So do you think that one day they will unify everything? So you think they still be segmented? Since you've been this for so long. No, and, I, and now I mean, it's, it's moving forward, but um, I think it's still, I think the difficulty is just to be able to, you know, uh, have every video camera and every phone be able to standardize on this. And that's not even talking about just sort of all the existing cameras that are out there. Um, and more and more, it's just getting more, harder and harder to actually transcode this stuff on the fly. So you need sort of dedicated CPUs to be able to understand this stuff on mobile devices or on digital cameras. Okay, but interoperability. So uh, you have a team. Okay, you know that you work very well with chat. Okay, a lot of the rest of the people within your team, eventually, is there any way that you bring them together? Well, how's the dynamic like during that time when you're first starting? Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think that uh, maybe there are one or two, but as far as I can remember, we never conducted a single interview for engineers at YouTube. Uh, Everybody was taken from eBay or PayPal. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, you know, it was, we were lucky in a lot of ways, not just the, the sort of flash video codecs were out there at the time, but also eBay stock price wasn't doing very well in 2005. Um, and we happened to work with many of these same engineers for already four or five years. Uh, so it wasn't just with chat, uh, but a, across the board, a lot of engineers that worked on sort of for example, the, the backend services have, I mean, it's, it's payments and it's, you know, uh, banking, financial industry, but the, the backend systems on how to scale out this infrastructure, a lot of it is still the same technologies there. So uh, many, of the, many of the first group of engineers when it came to the, the scalability side of things all came from uh, the PayPal team. But how do you snatch them over? I mean, yes, maybe eBay is not doing too well, but how do you manage to convince them to come over? Because then after all, YouTube that time, I would believe that it's still a little bit young and small and junior. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that one is established. Uh, yes, yeah, so we didn't want to make it too obvious. It was always uh, assumed that somebody was looking at just in corporate email systems, somebody was looking at all the emails coming in, especially if they came from an at YouTube.com domain. Um, so it was, a, it was always these uh, cryptic emails to people inside PayPal that said, it was just a subject. It was, you know, I haven't seen you in a long time. Let's get coffee, and then <laughs> call me, uh, and then and then we would talk. And then somehow, usually two weeks later, they would be packing up and leaving. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's just like Rob mentioned about it, that a leader, a good leader, is the people who are able to get people to come and work for him uh, for free. Uh, so, so basically, that uh, I guess this is what you, you guys did very well and the food, uh, all these things together. But along the way where you're doing the innovations and uh, you are start seeing um, uh, scaling and building, um, you focus on the product first and user, but um, in terms of um, monetization and revenue model, you wasn't looking at it initially. How did you convince the uh, investor that this is a viable thing to support you? I, uh, I mean, I think that uh, it's a tricky question as to when to, I mean, I think it's always, yeah, you always, I think, follow the product before the, the revenue, but I think um, the revenue model was always there, which is, if you actually look at CPM rates on just, uh, uh, on what Google was doing, on just text ads, and you're looking at, well, it, it's a huge range, but let's say you know, anywhere from 50 cents to $50, and then when you're actually looking at 15 second or 30 second pre-rolls, interstitials, post-rolls, you're, you're talking at least starting point is $20, $25 CPMs for, you know, for, for a thousand impressions of these videos. Um, but when we were, but at the same time, you know, I think, uh, say there's, there's sort of three verticals that if you think of YouTube, the, the, the sort of product um, is comprised of three different verticals. There are the users that come and search, browse, and actually watch the videos themselves. Uh, they're the users that actually create the content, the content creators, and many of them also watch videos. And then, but then there's a third, which is there's the advertising community. And, uh, they want to be able to put the, the sort of most relevant videos, or I think they just want to put their ads on the most popular videos. But it's a trick is to see how do you make all three of these parties happy at the same time. And it's a very difficult thing. I think the reason why Google is so successful is that Google's been able to pull up a similar trick. The people that are searching happen to actually 
get ads that are really relevant to what they're searching on. Um, and so it kind of makes all three happy. It's not the ads are annoying, but the ads are actually in many ways helpful. Uh, and so that was a trick that YouTube was trying to follow as well. Well, how do you actually make videos, or how do you want to get people to watch pre-rolls, not get irritated by them as, as, as commercials, as ads, but actually think that they're you know, uh, relevant, they're, they're, they're funny. Um, and that was something that we, to be honest, I don't think we really ever figured out prior to the acquisition of YouTube by Google. It was something that we tinkered around with, but it was really only in the last two, three years that I think that it's, it's really kind of taken off. Uh, but when we're talking to, I think when you're talking and you're presenting uh, the deck to VCs, it's, it's very easy to look at the pure numbers and the number of people that were watching. It's just to say, even if you were to put a stamp on the lowest CPM rates that you would get, look at what, just doing a quick math to say, well, it would generate at least this much revenue. So uh, as far as, the, I think as far as the first round and second round of funding went, it was about user growth, it was about content growth, and not so much about monetization. So the, the market is, uh, I would say the investment market between the uh, US and as well as Asia is reasonably different because uh, in Asia the advertising market is still not as big. Okay, and although it's growing, but it's growing at a slower rate. Uh, so sometimes we look at uh, Facebook, Facebook is uh, re reasonably big in the US, but uh, Apple in Asia is still very, very small mm -hmm. comparatively. So if we are looking at uh, our entrepreneurs out here, okay, who are thinking of, hey, maybe we want to expand the US. So what is your advice to them? And what, what do you think they should do? Because this is a very, very different market that they grow up with and eventually go to another market that is quite different. What is your advice to them? Like what should they do when they go to the US? Um, well, I mean, I don't have as much sort of uh, uh, local domain expertise, you know, but I spent quite a bit of time uh, in, in Taiwan kind of tackling and helping sort of local startups and entrepreneurs tackle a similar problem here. Uh, in, in the case of Taiwan, you know, it's a, it's a country with a population of about 23 million. They have many successful local companies and products that are created there, but very few of them ever extend out. So they have 80%, 90% market share, and they're good ideas, and some of them still haven't been replicated outside of Taiwan. However, very few of them ever make it outside the, the sort of the borders of the country. And it's, it's, I mean, it's a difficult task, right, to be able to, um, for a lot of these guys, to be successful in Taiwan, you don't need to know how to navigate through uh, AWS and, and Amazon. A lot of this, the sort of staples of what you need to know and what you need to operate on if you want to be operating successfully in North America, you never even, you, you know, you don't have to learn this stuff if you're going to be operating with it just Korea, just Taiwan, um, and, and the huge, huge part is internationalization or localization. Right? Um, that, uh, it almost probably takes more time to, if it's a really hot idea, it takes more time to take that successful version of the product that's been written and operating in Chinese and translating and internationalizing that product than to completely rewrite the thing in English to begin with. And so by the time that you do have a very successful startup, there's going to be <clears throat> multiple people around the world that's already copied and rewritten and deployed a version of that product in English and uh, deployed it in the US. Um, so one of the advice that I have for sort of startups in Taiwan is um, at least the 1.0 version of the product. I, the, I just give them two options. One, they're either it has to be completely in English or two, it's in English or and Chinese, but it cannot be just in Chinese. And I, I think that's, that's really key to be able to sort of operate this data, to be able to have a very, very early on to be able to develop for the market that you're going after rather than developing for a different market and then inter trying to internationalize and translate that. Oh, that's interesting. So uh, the advice is basically that um, try to internationalize it and eventually, hopefully, when you're in the market, you'll probably be able to prosper. And back to the questions of you, uh, UQ. Uh, how do you manage to get the attention of uh, Google? Okay, mm -hmm. I'm still I'm still kind of big, big it up. Okay, for the longest time we've been thinking that uh, how did that happen? Okay, but of course it is early day. And uh, what is the advice for our startup out here if they want to so called catch the attention of Google? What should they do? <laughs> um, it, was, uh, it was about uh, five days or so between. Uh, the, it was first internally with the board members of YouTube to talk about whether or not it was time to sell. 
And of course, you know, hindsight is everything. But at the time, uh, it was you know, a team of about 65 people. About half of it were engineers. It was, I don't know how many of them have taken a weekend off for the entire, I mean, it's just that the team was exhausted. It was very, nine data centers, but uh, I think we prided ourselves in being the team with the, you know, the most amount of bandwidth push, the amount of, uh, the amount of uh, storage that we were using uh, per employee was by far the largest across any company in the world. We were using over 10% of the internet's traffic at the time, and it was just a group of, you know, probably 30 engineers were pushing all this traffic around. Um, so uh, the opportunities there, uh, at the time, for example, Apple didn't come out with the iPhone yet. That was still uh, sort of on the brinks. We were looking at doing sort of web mobile versions of the product. You had to, if you're going to do the mobile version of the product, like we talked about earlier, the flash codec isn't supported on all these mobile devices. So then you had to take all these terabytes and petabytes of data and retranscode all this stuff using CPU. That you know, you just it's just, just a lot of CPU resources, a lot of a lot of man resources that we didn't have. Um, we uh, and that's, so uh, you know internally we said okay we need to we need to partner up with somebody that can help us with it. Uh, it's kind of little known that we actually talked to another company before we talked to Google. Uh, uh, two days prior we had I don't know if there's a Denny's here I don't know if it's a, it's a <laughs> uh, we, we we met with uh, Yahoo um, at a sort of a local 24 hour 24 seven diner called Denny's there in. Uh, in the Bay Area, it's, it's, you know, it's pervasive across the U.S. But the reason why we chose Denny's was because uh, we didn't want to be seen in our YouTube offices talking to Jerry Yang and the CEO Terry Semo at the time, uh, and then we didn't want to be driving into the campus of, of, of Yahoo as well. So we just thought that this 24-hour diner that just happened to be in between the two offices, nobody's ever going to recognize Jerry, and nobody's going to know who we are. Uh, so we we had a meeting with with. Uh, with Yahoo, but uh, we, it was really two days after that we had this sort of same discussion, actually at the same diner, the same dining room table, um, at, with Google as well. But you know, the, I think what's more important for us is it was more of a decision on our part to see who we wanted to partner up with, uh, whether it was Yahoo or whether it was Google. Um, I think for and it's easy, in hindsight, seeing what's happened with Yahoo and what's happened with Google since 2000, 2007. Uh, but at the time, I think we were really looking at what the, the sort of internal organizational structure of, of Google. So the way that uh, uh, Google is structured, it's very much, there's a, a lot of software verticals. And so they had a whole team that was focused on internationalization. And they had a whole team that was there to work on the mobile versions of their products. And so all the different products that are there at Google, there's the mobile versions that are developed by this team. Um, there's there's a big, big, big legal team at Google, which we needed at YouTube to help defend all the lawsuits that were coming in. Uh, and it was a lot easier to use, whereas Yahoo was uh, a lot more unified, right? So they had entire teams that were uh, ver not vertically built, but horizontally split across entire product lines. And so there would be a whole team that's working on, say, Yahoo Mail, or there would be a whole team that's working on Yahoo Search. But then in that instance, it would be a lot more difficult for YouTube to be able to be acquired and then be able to say what we need help is, is mobile internationalization because we would have to almost rehire these teams with the resources. Um, so that would, I mean, it was really quick, quick, uh, and you know, at the time it was, uh, uh, I think it was, it was a big gamble on the part of Google as well to buy that. They, they still had Google Video at the time, which happened to be, you know, our, our biggest competitor at the time. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it worked out very, very well since then. Okay, now I know why I bug up the wrong tree because all the time I thought that. Uh, you are trying to present yourself to Google and uh, let Google choose you, but it is the other way because uh, you are in the position to choose who, which partner you want to work with. Okay, either Google or Yahoo. I mean, if you go to Yahoo, maybe you will save them. <laughs> 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 but anyway, come back to this. Is that, uh, it's uh, very interesting to learn about what uh, uh, Steve had. I mean, the whole experience of it, right from the beginning of building the team, uh, thinking of technology, eventually, the, uh, I would say that even the exit is a little bit accidental, right? But uh, that is a progression path. Uh, I noticed that some of you are uh, aging at uh, what seems to have some questions you want to ask. Uh, we just open up your floor and maybe you can take a few questions, okay? And uh, what do you feel about this, uh, this, uh, this experience as well as uh, 
things that you want to ask me. Okay? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe. Maybe. It's very sound like super easy. Right? It was just all like natural progression. What was like the challenging part of the I didn't mean to make it sound that easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you were having a chat in the garage, and then afterwards, like, so what was the most challenging thing for you? Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, there's just, just off the top of my head, you know, we were about three hours away from running out of storage on a couple of occasions. Uh, I mean, just running out of upload storage, so that we were thinking about, and, and at the time, still, there was no AWS, so you couldn't go on and go and sort of just some pretty cloud registration and just say, give me another 30 servers. At the time, it was always three weeks for the data, for the actual, you know, 42 U racks of machines when you ordered, at least three weeks before it came. At least three weeks, somebody had to be waiting at the end of a truck, offload these racks, and then put it into Equinix data centers. Uh, and so it was always guessing, and it was, you know, for the first nine months again, it was off my, my own credit card, and so it was, being extra careful about trying to guess when is that next peak going to be, when is, and you have to guess three weeks in advance and not guessing, trying to guess over. Um, but I do think that um, the, I mean, not me, but just the, the entire engineering team at YouTube, had, they've done it before. They, they were at PayPal and they, they've gone through, uh, so there were challenges, technical challenges, but many of those same technical challenges you just kind of break away the, the skin of it, and they're all the same across multiple companies in terms of scalability. I think the, uh, the biggest challenge YouTube had was not engineering and not the product, but um, legal, uh, in both inside the US and international. Uh, inside the US, there was a, a Digital Millennium Copyrights Act that kind of protects the uploaders, and so the reason why uh, YouTube content isn't reviewed by everyone is that it automatically, any content that you upload to YouTube is automatically available to view. Um, and there are certain things in there now with audio fingerprinting and video fingerprinting that can say that this video has 30 seconds of content from the Beastie Boys, and so we're gonna take this down or we're gonna keep it up depending on the relationship that YouTube or, or Google has signed with the record labels. Uh, but at the time, it was, with the way that DMCA is written, there's no other way that you can create a user-generated content site other than let all this content be available and then let the users be the ones that determine what's, what is sort of fit and apt to be staying up on the site or to be taken down. Uh, but, I mean, that's, it's, here's, here's the thing, I mean, the example is like, a, you know, you have a two-minute clip and then it's got all sorts of stuff in there. Um, it has 15 seconds of clips, of, of just audio clips in the background, you know, 15 seconds of, of clips that people are actually putting in and mixing it together. And then you have to find out whenever these videos are, are played, where, the, where it was uploaded from, where, where the actual viewer is gonna be coming in from. So uh, a lot of these guys, Warner Music, EMI, Sony, they all have different branches all across the world. So then you have to, I mean, you're talking about a CPM rate of about five cents for a thousand impressions. So that's five cents divided by a thousand. You're talking about how to divide up that amount, however, 30 different ways, you know? And there's just so, and then it depends on who actually has, if, a, if, a, if many of these video clips have multiple audio clips in them, and trying to figure out all that fits in. Um, I think uh, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes was uh, uh, the, the first, sort of viral video on YouTube was a video that was uploaded by, well, I'll describe the video first and then it's surprising who uploaded it. Um, it was a, a Ron Adidio video who was kind of juggling, this is back in 2000, late 2005, and it was uh, Ron Adidio taking a soccer ball and juggling, it was a football stadium and he was juggling this soccer ball off the top of the goal post. And, uh, and the video's kind of shaking uh, the whole time and it looks like it's an amateur taking this video. There is, in the upper right hand corner, there's a little logo that says Nike on it, um, but you don't really think, you just think that that's just part of the uh, actual football stadium. Um, and that received, it was, viral, it was a viral hit. Um, it was uploaded by a user named, uh, a username with Joe B, J O E B, a very anonymous sounding username. Uh, we got a, we got a, a call from the legal team up in sort of Portland, Oregon, from Nike that said, take this video down. I don't know who uploaded it, but this is our content and you can't have this up. Um, and in the meantime, can you tell us where this video came from? Can you track it down, take a look at the IP address of the uploader? 
to figure out who uploaded it. So we tracked it back, and you know, funny enough, the IP address came from the same IP address that the email from the legal team from <laughs> Nike sent. I mean, it was Nike that uploaded the video in the first place. It was their marketing department that was trying to, to I mean, it just showcases, I think, that it, it was a difficult time to be whenever you take a look at a video, and sometimes you really don't know who's uploading that video because the I think the viral the sorry the marketing department especially at the dawn of sort of internet marketing they're always looking at ways to be able to get they were so happy that this video got a million video views uh, but they I don't think they ever sent that email to the legal department that said that they were going to be doing this um, and so it was us doing this and it happened time and time again where you have these really popular videos but I think legal was and this is just in the US outside the US you have a lot of these problems that uh, are, because they, they don't have the DMCA and they have other laws that kind of protect user, user rights. Thank you. Okay, they have right here. Check Hi, I was just wondering, um, what is it about Silicon Valley that makes it such a, what, what, is it, what is it about Silicon Valley that makes it sort of like a mecca for startups and all these interesting companies that we're using every day now? And to what extent can that ecosystem be replicated? Why, why don't we see Silicon Valley equivalents popping up in other parts of the world. See it be in Singapore, be it Shenzhen. You know, what is it about Silicon Valley that makes it so unique? Um, I, I mean, I, to be honest, I mean, I, I can take a few guesses, and I, I I'm, I'm, uh, but I'm not for sure exactly. And I think a lot of people are trying to solve, they're trying to figure out that sort of the top ten value companies in the last decade or over two decades um, in the tech world. They all for some reason, are within sort of 15 mile radius of one another. Uh, they're all in the Bay Area, and you wonder, uh, especially for something like technology startups, where really you need a, a, what, a computer internet connection, and, and that's all you really need, theoretically, to be able to create the service. So why is it that, of all the places that have those two things, those two conditions met, um, that they can't recreate these sort of billion dollar companies? Um, I, I do think that, uh, like, sort of anecdotally, had we had the idea for sort of YouTube in 1999, um, barring the conditions that I don't think technology conditions were there to actually see YouTube succeed in 1999, but even if we had this idea, let's say in 2005, and if Chad and I hadn't seen what it was like for PayPal to succeed, um, it was unlikely that we would have actually taken that. It was an expensive endeavor and a risky one to actually say, uh, I'm going to quit working for two years, I'm going to sort of take, stop taking the salary, I'm going to put in $100,000 of my own cash to be able to pay for uh, sort of the, all the ISP costs, all the bandwidth costs of, of starting this. Um, but it was actually through, I think, PayPal where you saw kind of a similar, uh, it, it's, it's different, but abstractly it's a similar concept where these people that have never done payment services ever in their life yet they were able to create sort of the, this, the, one of the global leader in payments and payment services, right? And I think that um, Silicon Valley is lucky enough to have seen, starting from 95, the Netscapes, the Yahoo's in 96, um, to the Googles and the, and the Facebooks, and now many of the sort of, uh, even with PayPal, many of the people that are leaving from PayPal, I think one of the reasons why there's so many successful startups from ex-PayPal employees are because of the very fact that there are a lot of PayPal employees that have started companies that have been successful, and just about everybody that leaves PayPal, I think every engineer tries to create a company, and just by that very, that very fact alone, you know, the, just the, the overall number of attempts, the the, the 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 risk is still there, but I think the probability-wise, there's going to be things like success. just the universities, the lifestyle, the weather, does that all play? Oh, I think the weather. Has, 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 has to do with it. No, I mean, uh, there's there's other things, right? Uh, like early stage capital, um, there's not, it's harder to find that elsewhere in the world. It's very easy to, to be able to locate capital. It's very easy to be able to locate a sort of thing, people outside of engineering. So uh, to find a CFO that actually has uh, experience working with uh, early stage startups is very easy in the Bay Area. It's more difficult elsewhere. Um, and so I think that uh, across the board, there's a lot of these things. And you can drive down 101 in Silicon Valley, and you see, you know, whatever, Sun Microsystems, and Macromedia, and Oracle. And then there's no other highway in the world where you can see within 25 minutes of driving all these companies. Basically, just to add on to, to that question, uh, the previous question, uh, 
you were dropping names like Sequoia Capital and all that. These are quite big names. So are they very accessible in, 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 in the region? And another question uh, also relating to the start of uh, YouTube. How difficult was it for you to uh, obtain your first five, uh, 50,000 users? Um, well, it's the first question first. I mean, I think that um, there is that part of Silicon Valley um, where you know we happen to have the connections to Sequoia because of the PayPal connections and the, eventually the sort of partner and the board member at, of YouTube and the partner at Sequoia Capital was uh, was Roloff who was the old CFO at PayPal. So we all kind of knew him, and you know that does that doesn't happen everywhere, right? To to be able to uh, meet sort of all this uh, on Sand Hill Road there in Menlo Park. All the top VCs are all along this one one road, and so you can actually visit. You know, I don't know where else in the world you can actually visit a dozen top VCs all in an afternoon's trip down one street. Um, so that I mean, there there is some of that that uh, uh, through internal connections that we were able to access this. If we had just gotten to Silicon Valley, it would have been very difficult, I think, to get our feet in the door um, to be able to talk to these guys. Um, the second question was, uh, how difficult was it for you to obtain your first 50,000 users for YouTube? Uh, it was difficult. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> well, uh, so I think um, it was difficult to, uh, to obtain users. And so when we did our original uh, presentation at Sequoia, we said, uh, YouTube is a business based on content, not based on users. And so it was, it was based on video views that we were looking at. Um, but uh, funny story there, we were getting about about 10 to 12,000. This was already further ahead, but we were still only getting about 10 to 12,000 user registrations a day. And honestly, at YouTube, you don't, there's really no reason to register for an account. I mean, you register to upload. And otherwise, I mean, to comment or to, to sort of flag bookmarks, or sorry, to flag favorites, to, sh to share. Most of that, you really don't, the people don't see a need to actually register for the account. Um, but uh, all of a sudden, after one release, I remember we thought there was a bug because it climbed from what was you know, 11,000, 12,000 a day. And then all of a sudden, after the release that night, it went to 96,000 users a night. Uh, and for sure, it was a bug. We looked through everything and, and just made sure that the count was there. And it turned out to be a correct count. It was 96,000 registrations that day. And then so we looked at what was different from yesterday's version of YouTube to today's version of YouTube. And then there was a there was a thing in there that said um, uh, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was uh, this content needs it looks like it's mature content and it needs you to register <laughs> for an account before you can view this content. And that's <laughs> so that helps. <laughs> kind of fundamentally different from Google in a few ways. I think that uh, you know, we had the, sort of the real-time transcoding, which Google didn't have. They were actually monitoring the pieces of content and actually had a team that was looking at it. And it wasn't clear exactly when it was going to be accepted. So you would upload a piece of video onto Google Video, and it was some time later you would get a notification that said this video is ready to be, sort of be shared or be viewed. Um, they still not for the entire history of Google Video, but for a long period there, they still required you to download um, an application to use the service to be able to upload. So uh, I think that very fact that you had to download something, that extra step really stopped a lot of users uh, from, from using the service. Uh, and then I think the, the ability to you know, uh, embed the YouTube video onto a lot of other sites other than just YouTube.com. Uh, that was something that Google Video didn't have early on, and that was something that, uh, you know, the days of sort of MySpace and, and, and even with Facebook about sort of these other, all these other communities and all these services that were getting a lot of traffic, 
and they had user communities that had videos to share, but nothing on the site supported it. But because YouTube allowed embeddable videos, and Google Video didn't, it ended up being sort of the choice by standard that people chose to. Yeah, and, and, I, and I, I mean, I think uh, here, like, I think uh, the there's a kind of the final announcement of the acquisition of Google uh, or, or of YouTube by Google was made uh, sort of I remember on a Monday, two one thirty p.m. Um, sort of four thirty. Uh, East Coast time after the close of the market when we made this announcement um, that uh, that Google has acquired YouTube when we had to do uh, a few sort of uh, media PR announcements um, during that period. But it was looking also, you know, I think it was always looking inside why was it that that, that Google video couldn't do this. One of the things was Eric Schmidt, the CEO, uh, on Sunday prior to the announcement of this deal, he came and um, we were still talking with uh, a lot of lawyers at the time, Saturday and Sunday, kind of rushing to make sure all the paperwork's ready. And Eric came and took just uh, Chad and myself. We went into a room in private, the three of us, and he kind of told us in private that you know after the acquisition, um, there's going to be you're going to be getting a lot of uh, uh, inquiries. You're going to be getting a lot of sort of partnership offers from different departments within Google. Google Maps is going to want to integrate, you know, um, and all these people are going to want to integrate and. Uh, Truly, the thing that I, you guys have complete freedom to do anything you want for the next one year, uh, and you can ignore anything requests, and all I care about is just, and it was like two things, it was like an infinite number of happy users and an infinite number of good content coming onto the site. Um, and I mean, I think the things like that, that maybe, um, he just kind of said like, we don't know what that secret sauce is, but we just let this team do it your, your way. Uh, just curious about what you think the eventual state for video is uh, in terms of user-generated videos. On one hand, you have content creators acting more and more like studios, so becoming more professional in their production. But on the other hand, you have the Vines, the Hyperlabs, and the Facebook auto playing videos, so which encourages a lot more people to capture making videos. So where where is it headed? I mean, I think that's going to be hard to say because uh, if there's as long as there's actually no door to stop anybody from uploading videos all that is still going to continue to get created and all and, and if anything more videos are going to get created I think the problem lies in the so I think that curve will always trend upwards which is the amount of content that's being created on a daily basis on a per minute basis on a per individual basis uh, I think what's more important is the, you know, but it's harder to put a stamp on which is good content and how do you and I think but more importantly is how do you as a user actually find relevant content that you want to watch that you haven't seen before, but that's relevant to your personal tastes? Uh, and I think that that started to become, so you know, I think that you have maybe what, 15, 20 minutes of time, and if that's the case, how do you actually stuff inside those 15, 20 minutes uh, without, with the least number of searches possible and the, the best recommendations or personalized recommendations possible, 15 minutes and 20 minutes of good content for your time. And that's the stuff that, that sort of YouTube's really trying to figure out, looking at uh, sort of a, a lot of user history, a lot of what other people are watching and trying to actually get better recommendations. Okay, let's take one last question. Okay, uh, the lady behind. on two levels. One of them was become the sort of the, the standard internet platform for videos, 
right? And, and, and in that sense, it becomes just upload a video, transcode it, and make sure that any time you access it with this URL on any device, it's always the highest quality and it'll always be there. Uh, but then there is the other arm, which is how do we improve the, kind of getting back to this earlier case about how do you actually improve the average quality of the content that's being uploaded. And things like being able to do, um, throw in background music, um, being able to cut out some pieces of content, and being able to take what is a two minute, and, you know, very few people actually watch the entire five minute length of a video. Most people, like about 45 seconds in, they start zooming in on the right side to see what video they want to click on next. So very few people actually ever watch the entire clip. And so how do you actually, knowing that, how do you make it such that you take these long pieces of content and be able to kind of summarize it into stuff that ends up being exciting and relevant and then do that across the board for all pieces of content coming in. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you Steve today for spending this wonderful afternoon with us. And uh, well, thanks for sharing your journey in your startup as well as uh, some of your early, early day in uh, Banner Champagne and uh, all those wonderful things and story behind the scene. Okay, uh, we are going to have uh, uh, networking sessions uh, right after this one. I think the refreshment is outside. Okay, thank you, Steve, once again. Thank you.